he showed me that you stand up for what you believe in, even if everybody else doesn't see it for what it is. Welcome. This is Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, episode 594, with today's guest, Dr. Gene Kanokogi. I'm Jeremy Lesniak, host for the show and founder here at Whistlekick, where everything we do is in support of the traditional martial arts. If you want to see everything we do, visit whistlekick.com. That's our online home. It's a place to find our store. And that's one of the ways that we fund all the things that we do and give you for free. So if you want to support us, if you want to make a purchase at the store, maybe buy a uniform or some gear or a book or a shirt, you know, a bunch of stuff over there, training programs, use code podcast15, P-O-D-C-A-S-T-1-5. That's going to get you 15% off. And it lets us know that, hey, you like the show and you're willing to help us out. Now, the show itself has its own website, whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You'll see new episodes of this show twice a week. And why do we do what we do with this show? Well, it's to connect and educate and entertain the traditional martial artists of the world. If you want to support that work, there are plenty of ways you can help. You could make a purchase, like I said, but you could also share an episode. Follow us on social media. You could tell a friend. You could pick up a book on Amazon, leave a review, or support our Patreon. P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash whistlekick. It's a place to go. You can support us monthly with as little as $2. And the more you spend, the more exclusive content we're going to throw your way. I love all of our guests. I really do. And I love every episode. It's it's like It's like kids. It's like the way I hear people talk about kids. They love them all. But once in a while, we have an episode pop up that just makes me go, whoa. And this was a whoa episode. It was funny. It was poignant. It was powerful. And it was about not only our guest, but several other people around the guest. We talk about people who have been on the show. We talk about people that we've talked about on the show. We talk about people that you have heard of and others that you haven't and others that you maybe didn't realize had any connection to martial arts. It's an awesome story. And why am I being so vague? Because if I tell you any more, it's going to ruin the surprises that unfold as we have this conversation. So instead of ruining surprises, I just rather let it happen. So here goes with the show. Hey, Dr. Gene, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Hi there. I, I appreciate you doing this. Thanks for coming on the show. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Which, you know, audience, we we were just talking and, you know, I'm, I'm not going to, we're not going to go into the stuff that we talked about because one, one of the things that I get to do as host of the show, you know, this is, there isn't a lot that I get to to say, oh, this is mine. But, you know, the, the conversations with the guests before and after, those, those are mine. Once in a while, something will happen after we close the show and we'll edit it back in. But the hour, hour before, the stuff that we just shared, that you shared with me before, kind of kind of big stuff kind of heavy stuff and really makes me excited for what we're going to get into because if if you're able to and willing share that stuff after having talked to me for 120 seconds where are we going to be in a half hour yeah i'm i'm willing to share uh whatever that we're interested in talking about because really this is a story about uh, my life is really the story of a martial artist and the crossovers that happen uh, through life with myself, with other martial artists Mm. and and getting through uh, some adversities in life as well. Yeah. And one of the things I love about our format is that you can listen just about any episode and you can identify, you know, here are some things that are different about that individual story versus my own, but here are a lot of things that I can relate to. We have so much in common as martial arts and as people, and that seems to come through on the show. It does. It does. You know, martial artists, we're, we're a unique group because it doesn't matter what style that you practice because it's fundamentally the foundations are common. The foundations and principles all have some level of commonality, all have been derived from ancestries way before even we existed. So that commonality really is the impetus to give us the potential to sit and have good conversations and and kick back, enjoy, respect, and learn from one another. 
Yeah. It is an incredible thing that we do, no matter whether you look at it from a comical perspective, I make my best friends by punching them in the face or a, a more philosophical perspective. You know, there, there's so many different ways to look at what we think and, and do in, in the context of this wider world of martial arts. Now you, you're a judoka. I am. And, and I how, am. how'd you get started? How it's, you know, judo well, has a, a passionate following, but it's not, at least in, in the U S it's not the biggest or even close to the biggest contingent of martial arts practitioners. It, it isn't, but yet judo seems to be my second family. Judo people are my second family. And, you know, circling back to you saying uh, just some oddities of phrases that probably non-martial art artists would be able to fully embrace. I grew up telling everybody that my mother chokes me. So, <laughs> I knew what and, I and, I, and I was happy about it. I was like, yeah, my mother choked me about four times yesterday. My neck's a little sore. Uh, so, and that goes to your question on how I started in judo. I was literally or just about born on the mat. My mom was in the middle of teaching a judo class at uh, probably the Prospect YMCA. And uh, she was pregnant with me. Her student was one of her uh, one of her students was also her physician and uh, it's they said okay well it's time to go to the hospital so they go over to methodist hospital in brooklyn and now she's waiting the contractions are happening and and in between contractions her student dr bowersax had to test for his kata and he had to go for his forms so uh his form practice and understand you know all of the different throws and what she did is in between contractions was go over his kata and they were in the delivery waiting area practicing, gripping each other, doing the steps. Uh, I don't know if he threw her while, you know, and induced labor by, by throwing her a few times. Maybe, maybe that's how I came out. So I almost got born on the mat, but uh, they made it to the hospital in time. And so I was born to two senseis. I was born to Rusty Kanakogi and Yohei Kanakogi, two magnificent judo senseis. Rusty, my mother, and we'll talk about her story in a little bit, was the mother of women's judo who got women's judo into the Olympic Games. I, I was literally biting my hand as you're talking through that story. The, the idea of martial artists transitioning martial arts practice into a delivery room, it makes sense. But I can only imagine, I would love to have been a fly on the wall to watch the reactions of the doctors and nurses around, because who does that? Especially then. Who Especially does that? in the late 60s, a doctor gripping his patient and tossing her in the air while she's in labor or holding her in, in a kata form, or who knows if, if he had to simulate an arm lock. Could you only imagine the looks of the hospital uh, staff of what is this physician doing to his patient or his patient, my mother, ch ch chucking him up in the air and going for a throw? This movie needs to happen just so we can see this scene. 100%. I, be <laughs> I, I believe it. that. There, there's plenty of material that the world does need to see mm. from this story. So that's quite the genesis, you know, om almost literally born on the mat. And I, I would imagine given that upbringing or rather that, that origin, whether or not you had a, a choice for judo, you probably just kind of fell into it before you were even aware of the option. Yes. It just, uh, if, if, they're, if they're in training, you're standing there in a crib on the side, whatever it was, and just start mimicking? 100%. You know, children, children are sponges, and they learn, they imitate, they, they really are the best absorption of knowledge because I didn't even realize now, uh, all these years later, I had no idea how much I really learned, how much I remember, how much I absorbed. So as a child watching, uh, going to my parents teaching their judo classes, uh, I was off to the side rolling around on the mat and I had tons of different babysitters because everybody that were the judo students were part of my judo family. So aunts and uncles up the wazoo, 
uh, that were the judo students. And we became one big judo family. Uh, subsequently, the name of our dojo was Kyushu Dojo. Uh, Kyushu is a southern island in Japan where my dad is from. And uh, just going off a little bit on a tangent, uh, my mother met my father in Japan while she was training in judo. And my father is of samurai lin lineage. So um, all the way in southern Japan, uh, matter of fact, there's a castle, uh, I think it was in the 14 or 1500s, that was called Kanakogi Castle. And now it's since been named Kumamoto Castle. Uh, there was also a cave in Kumamoto where Miyamoto Musashi wrote the Book of Five Rings. But going back to me roly-polying on the map. <laughs> not, not that you were born to any kind of incredible legacy to hold up for anything. Man, that's those are some big shoes to fill. Really, uh, you know, gigantic shoes. And it, it's funny because my mom had big feet. My father always had to point out that she had big feet. Like foot, when you got hit by her foot for a foot sweep, you you felt like you were you were hit by a truck. Uh, it was that. And um, when she was training in Japan, they were amazed. You know, five foot nine woman with size eleven triple E's, uh, gigantic feet on the mat. They didn't know what to do with her. Uh, so I do have, I did have some big shoes to fill, but what was really great about, even though both of my parents were senseis, they let me find my way, whether it be in judo or any other sports. So they never really pushed judo, but they welcomed me into judo. Hmm. What's the difference? Welcoming me was, um, asking if I'd like to go to judo, if I'd like to practice, or if I'd like to compete or just practice for fun or exercise, or welcoming me to just do the exercise before I go off and play softball or volleyball mm. or whatever else I wanted. Uh, the other sports I did play, I played softball and I made it pretty far in, in that sport. And my parents were very supportive and they went to my softball games. Uh, but then as I started progressing in judo and started competing and winning junior nationals and junior tournaments, I was at a crossroads. Do I follow my judo career? Do I follow my softball endeavors? So we, we came to a, an agreement that my softball tournaments typically were between 3 and 6 p.m. And then I would have judo from 7 to 10 p.m. So I was very, very athletic, needless to say, growing up. And eventually I took the judo career, uh, judo path, because I thoroughly enjoyed the sport, the philosophy, the kindness, the fact that I'm bowing to somebody who's about to kick my butt or I'm about to choke them out, but I'm respecting them for thanking and thanking them through my bow to allow me to be a better judoka. It's pretty powerful. It is. It is. And the philosophies, the mutual benefit for both and, and doing things with the least amount of resistance, it's just so cooperative, although it's extremely combative as well. I mean, it's, I, I've had some, some matches where I was choked and I literally turned blue, and, uh, but it showed me I could get up and fight. And, and that's something that my mom would tell me all the time, no matter what. If I was thrown, it doesn't matter. Get up and fight. Um, and, that, and that carries over. And matter of fact, that's the name of the book that I just wrote called Get Up and Fight that chronicles and demonstrates the memoir of Rusty and, and our entire family and how she fought to not take no and how she fought against and broke the glass ceilings and barriers to be able to open up the world of judo for women. Yeah, we'll, we'll get into that in, in just a moment. But before we do, I, I want to I wanna unpack your childhood a little bit more because you're, you're yeah. talking about two, well, it, you, you talked about your mother's high level of accomplishment. And I know we're going to go even further there with judo. And my suspicion, if she chose to be with your father, when she was in Japan training, he likely is, is was no slouch on the mat himself. No, uh, no, he wasn't. And they had two very distinct styles. Mm. Uh, and I was lucky enough 
to inherit uh, naturally inherit both of their styles. I don't know. Maybe it is genetic, uh, but then you know maybe it's because this is what they wanted to give to me as a gift as I was coming up in judo. So uh, my father being a little bit smaller, not that much smaller, but a little bit smaller, he had these pre this precision technique. Uh, they call it Kouchi Gary, which is an inner sweep of the leg. And my mother's throw was this grand, it was called Harai Maki Komi or Harai Goshi, and this grand rear, sw rear leg sweeping technique where you fly through the air and land on the other person. So the combination of inheriting both of those types of styles within judo was truly a gift, and, and it did me well as I uh, subsequently became a member of the U.S. judo team. I competed, of course, nationally and regionally, but also internationally, and uh, was afforded to compete against people who went on to be Olympians and went on to be uh, gold medalists. And, and I trained with the best of the best. And these people were actually also pioneers of women's judo because they were competing even before judo was in the Olympics. Wow. It's, it's a lot to carry. And, and it, we seem to have this recurring theme of, of big shoes and heavy weights on shoulders. Were you aware of the uphill battle for judo and specifically for women's judo when you were a kid? I was. You know, when I was a kid, it was, it was never just a, a normal, you know, go outside and play with your friend's childhood because my mom was constantly on the phone and writing letters and and yelling at people. But And I didn't completely understand until I got a little bit older. And she sat me down and she talked to me. And she said, you know, prepare yourself because in life, at least in this portion of it, there are going to be times where people are going to discriminate against you. And whether it be for race or merely the fact that you, because you're a girl or because you're becoming a woman. And it's not personal. It's their problem. So sometimes you will have to make it your problem and fight that discrimination and only ask for what is fair. So that, that's how she led me uh, in, in that heaviness of trying to fill shoes. So uh, just to lighten it a little bit, and, and you know, there's a lot of anecdotal, anecdotal uh, funnies. I don't know if you remember the commercial, but years ago, I, I'd say in the 80s, a karate gentleman came out and kicked the, the daylights out of Samsonite luggage, and the title of it was Kanakogi versus Samsonite. So that's my dad's commercial. So not only did, was my dad a judo expert, he was a karate expert, and he filmed that commercial that to this day, everybody still remembers. Oh, that's really cool. I'm going to try to find that on, on YouTube, see if we can link it. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's always, it's all okay. over YouTube. It's still a very popular, uh, part of, of viewing when people look up Kanakogi that pops up as well. But, you know, going, going back to, uh, my judo career, it opened, a, it, it opened my eyes to a lot of, uh, international things. I went to compete in Japan for the first time. And when I was in Japan earlier, you had said, you know, judo is not as popular in the U.S. as it is in other countries. And by the way, you're absolutely right. I think there's like, there's millions of competitors and judoka all over the world, except in the U.S. So I go to Japan and I was treated like a celebrity. Uh, kids were asking for my autograph. I, I'm on the U.S. team. They're they're banging drums. They're coming over and they just want to say hello. It, it was amazing. And even in Europe, they had the British Open. We'd go to Crystal Palace every year, and people just knew we were going to a judo tournament. Uh, here, you know, you want run around in a, in a white robe uh, through the streets of New York going to judo class or something. They would just look at you like Halloween's not until October. <laughs> yes. We've had a number of guests on the show who have been involved in judo. And they've spoken very openly, very passionately about the frustration that they have with the United States' place in the global judo landscape and this seeming, this, this frustration of karate and, and taekwondo being so strongly represented here in the U.S. and everything else vying for 
such a small percentage and, and this, this seeming weight. And yet, if you know your history of martial arts in the United States, judo really should be number one. You know, if you think back to Teddy Roosevelt and his passion for judo and for jujitsu when he was in office. Absolutely. You know, it, it's funny because uh, as my mom was fighting for Title IX uh, with the Women's Sports Foundation and alongside Billie Jean King, uh, she had the opportunity to meet several politicians, and one at the time was Hillary Clinton. Her first thing she asked Hillary was, where's judo? How come judo's not in the White House? And she explained about Teddy Roosevelt and his passion for judo. So uh, the question has been asked. So may maybe it it's in the future. Uh, judo, unfortunately, is extremely combative. And, and it bewilders me because the MMA and the PFL, that's so popular. So at first I thought, well, maybe because judo is so physically combative, you can choke someone, you can arm lock someone, uh, whereas some of the other styles might be prettier in the media. That's not the case any longer because people want to see the fighting. So what else is it? And, and it, it really is bewildering why it's not so popular. And, but I mean, in the United States, women's judo has come a very long way. I, I do have to credit USA Judo now to, as opposed to who USA Judo was uh, back then. Uh, back when Rusty was fighting to get women's judo into the Olympics, USA Judo was completely against her. And they even uh, told her, well, one of our re reasonings is, well, you know, what if your lady parts get hurt? And, you know, she retorted, well, your man parts are on the outside. Our lady parts are on the inside. What's the problem? I'm trying not to laugh because if I, if I, if I <laughs> go, I'm just, I'm not going to come back for a few minutes. That's hysterical. <laughs> Because, I mean, if you think about the flawed the argument, yes, it was the flawed arguments. It was the good old boys networks that, you know, women, what, shouldn't you be in the kitchen? So, you know, Rusty, yeah, you know what? I, I was happier with her out of the kitchen. I mean, granted, she made a couple of dishes, but she was much better at being the mother of women's judo and my sensei and my mother than, uh, than the Stouffer's stovetops. <laughs> nice. But one thing I have to tell you, you know, going into food, yeah. Rusty did one of our favorite pastimes was to go to Nathan's and grab a hot dog in Coney Island. As a family, we would go down to Nathan's. Uh, we'd walk around the boardwalk in Coney Island. They would go play handball because they, you know, they had to use their hands. And I'm thinking, oh gosh, her hands are getting stronger and she's going to choke me even more. So we'd go for some hot dogs and um, Rusty got this great idea. Any type of publicity she can get for women's judo she would. So Nathan's has this little thing called the hot dog eating contest every July. She was able to get myself and another girl from the German junior judo team entered in the contest, figure we would get some publicity for women's judo. Well, so it is. I don't even know how proud I should be, but I took second place in the Nathan's hot dog eating contest. <laughs> But I have to tell you, the girl who took first place was my friend from Germany who never had a hot dog. So two young judoka teenagers took first and second place in the hot dog eating contest back then. And coincidentally, we both have PhDs. So ergo, hot dogs make you smart. Uh, apparently. Now, obvious follow-up, how many hot dogs? I think it was nine for me and nine and a half for Birgit. Um, at that time, you know, it wasn't a Kobayashi kind of swallow everything whole. And you had to do it, I think, in two minutes, including the bun. And you were only allowed one glass of salsa. It's still quite impressive. You know, what, <laughs> what are they up to now? Like 50, 60 oh, in gosh. two minutes, which is insane. And for, forget about that for a moment. Forget about what people are doing now that's super insane. Even nine for a child <laughs> who has no experience in competitive eating that's that's quite impressive well she felt we were competitors you know our judo training prepared us to compete any anywhere and do it anything like it did. Uh, matter of fact, a few blocks from Nathan's now on West 17th and Surf, uh, right in front of the ball field, the street is co-named Rusty Kanakogi Way. Oh, what a, what a riot. She, she, it, so her, her impact wasn't just in this one angle. It was 
in effect, it was a a, a movement that it, it seems I'm, I'm struggling for the right word here. Maybe you can help me out. But there, there's there's this this vibe I'm picking up on that she was a, a force of nature that you you pretty much got with what she wanted or got out of the way because she was going to roll over you. Absolutely. Uh, I, I remember being interviewed for a television show when I was a kid, and I, I referred to her as the cinder block. She'll move when she wants to move. Uh, she really was, and, and you captured it, Jeremy, a, a force. As she's such a force that she's still today touching lives, empowering and inspiring people to get up and fight. It inspired me when I didn't think I had anything left inside. You know, circling back to my career, I, I didn't mention yet, I'm, an, I'm still active. I'm a federal agent and I've been in law enforcement for 23 years. Uh, you know, I, gr I grew up in Brooklyn. I'm also a fifth degree black belt in judo. Uh, one thing that really helped my get up and fight and because of my judo career and because of Rusty's force of nature is I'm a 9-11 first responder. So I was on that pile digging while it was still on fire. And that's when you just have to reach deep down inside when you feel like you've got nothing left, when you have no bit of energy, but for the right reason, you have to keep going and you have to keep working. So that's how the spillover truly, truly happens. Uh, it also gives you the tools to be able to take pause and be confident in your skills. So when you're acting and when you're reacting and when you're doing your job in a law enforcement career, it gives you the skills, that one split second skill of decision making, of knowing what to do in a given situation. So this, this is a lot of how it crossed over. Uh, it, it was just, it's an incredible force of nature that uh, to, every day Rusty inspires me to do something. And uh, she was very selfless in the fact that uh, she didn't do it for any type of personal gratification. She knew the right from the wrong and she knew it was wrong to be discriminated against. Did you ever feel like you were growing up under a shadow? It seems like with, with, with these larger than life events, it could be hard to form your own identity. Was it, was it like that? I definitely grew up in the shadows of Rusty. And it was, di it was difficult because having the name Kanakogi, either you are Rusty's daughter or you are Yohei's daughter, uh, and the expectation in the judo world uh, was, was uh, very, very high for how you conducted yourself, how you competed, for how you acted. And, you know, assuming that since I was Rusty's daughter, I also had to be boisterous and a bulldozer in meetings and, and whatnot. But then assuming that uh, given that I was Yohei's daughter, they thought maybe I was more quiet and, and um, uh, stayed more in the background. So I had to really find my own identity as a, in a careful balance. Uh, I'm the first one in my immediate family to go in a career in law enforcement. So I did find my way because I was able to find a career where I can still help people. I can positively affect lives. And it wasn't only through sport. And of course, you know, you do, you do uh, other activities as a law enforcement officer, like, you know, you help, um, with the Special Olympics and, and you help some of the inner, like one of the things I do is, or I did is volunteer and help inner city youth in sports. Uh, Rusty was involved with the sports and arts for schools. So there's such a crossover to be able to help people. Uh, now I, I volunteer as the director of mental health and peer support for the Federal Law Enforcement Officers Association. And I've just recently undertaken a volunteer position with Blue Hearts for Heroes, which helps law enforcement families with special needs children. Mm -hmm. So the shoes I filled and the, the identity that I formed, they took different directions, but stayed along the same paths. When I hear stories of people who grow up with powerful 
parents, and, and, and I mean that word in, in every possible iteration, the response of the children, and you see this often with multi-child families, is either to embrace the power and charge forward and whether or not you're, you're following in footsteps or finding your own identity to be very big, that, that may be successful, it may be notoriety, it could be many things, or to be the opposite end of the spectrum and to be very quiet and withdrawn and identity becomes, as you said, Rusty's daughter, Yohei's daughter, and to never find your own space. And it's, it's good to, to hear that you took that high bar and said, you know, I, I'm not going to hang back. I'm going to, I'm going to charge forward. Thank you. You know, uh, Rusty did talk to me about some of the mistakes that she made in her youth and some of the poor choices that she made. Uh, but however, those poor choices led her to become and develop the character that she was and led her to change the lives of, of hundreds of thousands of people by what she did. Uh, growing up, she, she grew up in a very tumultuous childhood. Um, her dad was an alcoholic gambler. Her mom was constantly working in Coney Island and, and got her hand mangled and uh, got hooked on the painkillers to offset the pain because there was no sick day. There weren't, weren't any sick days back then. So she ran around the streets with no guidance. Um, she had babysitters, which unfortunately they were uh, members of the sh what they called the freak show back then. But uh, that was the Pinhead Sisters and Milo the Mule Face Boy, which that's when Rusty started developing her character because she realized that even though these people look different, they treated me with respect and love. And she felt like they were part of her family. And she started formulating her own values. Uh, Rusty ran around uh, and she was the leader of a female gang in Coney Island. So I know she didn't want, and, and not a gang like <laughs> what I think of today. We're thinking more like in the movie Grease. Okay. But, um, you know, there was an incident where she was scheduled to have a schoolyard fight with uh, another female gang, and uh, the other female gang showed up. Her members did not. So Rusty took the brunt of it and then hunted down each one of her members and made sure that they felt the same wrath. Uh, because she believed in she believed in fairness, she believed in accountability, and doling out a beating to each one of her gang members who didn't show up. Well, that was accountability and fairness to her. Uh, but you know, she didn't want me to make the same mistake. So she, you know, I had a much better household. Her and my dad were best of friends. I mean, aside from soulmates, they were just best of friends, and he was so supportive for her antics and her. Uh, you know, in the beginning, she had she said, "Listen, women's judo needs to be a an Olympic sport." And how do we get there? And he supported her every step of the way, even when the other Japanese did not support him for supporting her. He showed me that you stand up for what you believe in, uh, even if everybody else doesn't see it for what it is. Uh, of course, now uh, mindsets have changed, but. You know, Rusty, the adversity that she suffered is in 1959, she competed in the YMCA championships as a fill-in for one of her teammates and because he was, he was injured and there were no women competing, so she had to fight a man. She beat the man fair and square and she beat him with a full point. She slammed him. It was, it was a brawl the way she explained it. Well, they took her medal away because she was a woman. And because of that, that was the pivotal point where she decided that no woman will ever suffer such an indignity ever again. And she's like, not on my watch and not for my daughter, not for my future. And so now every little girl that has the opportunity to put on a judo gi and say, I want to be an Olympian, that can happen because of Rusty. Mm. Wow. And that's, I mean, that's, it's an utterly amazing story. And it predates, uh, I, I'm, I've got my phone here and I'm quickly skimming. I want to make sure that I, I have my, my dates right. Um, but the woman who ran the Boston Marathon as a man. Yes, Which if, it does. I'm, if I'm doing my math right, your mother was 10 years earlier. I think so. 
I think and, so. And you know, all all of the the we'll, we'll use a nice word, the hullabaloo about a woman running. You know, if if we think about context mm-hmm. at that time, you know, physical contact, contact sports, especially between a man and a woman, was a huge deal. Yes. It's still probably a bigger deal now than it should be, but you know, regardless, if we think about the context, did you have the opportunity to have a conversation with her about her mindset at that time? Did she know she was stepping into a, a minefield? She didn't. At first, uh, she would, you know, she went there to support her team at the at the Utica YMCA because she knew the men were competing, but she went there to support her team and she brought her judo gi with her because she brought her judo gi everywhere just in case. And she availed herself to, for what they call uchikomi and form practice or warm up, uh, if you may, for the competition. So when she was doing the warm up with the guys she was thinking and she shared that, she said, well, I, w- I wish women could compete. This, was, this is really neat. And when she had the opportunity to compete then she she was told, well, just don't call attention to yourself. Just pull pull an even score. And then she's thinking, well, why should I do that? I train just the way the same guys train. And in her head, so she tried to hold back and then she just couldn't. It was just her body um, attacking and she heard her team cheering for her. So when she won, her she did share with me, she felt like, oh, wow, I won. Oh, crap, I won. <laughs> so now what? Now what's going to happen? And was she even, it, it, you know, I highlight this in the book because the book, by the way, is written a lot in her telling her story. So you can hear the, the capturing of Rusty's voice. So when the tournament director called her over and wanted to have a word, she thought, well, is this guy going to give me a compliment? And then right away she said, oh boy, um, maybe I'm in trouble for something. And uh, she was so excited that she can actually fight in judo in a competition and be rewarded as opposed to given a citation. So, you know, from her gang days. And when the tournament director, you know, asked her, and he said it in a very snide, like condescending tone, if she was a girl, uh, like she did something wrong. So that, um, I think I'm going a little off topic, but no, that, that's how it's... that's how Rusty described it to me. But she didn't know she was stepping into a minefield of women's rights. She didn't know, you know, at that time, I think Gloria Steinem was fighting for equality and started Ms. Magazine. So she didn't have that mindset, like I'm going to change the world. But she also, that day at the YMCA, when they took her medal away for just being a female, she said, no, this is not right. And it goes back to uh, her childhood of her babysitters being made fun of for looking different. She said, that's not right. When she married early in uh, to just get out of her house, and she had to go down south to uh, get the divorce early on in in her life, she was sitting in a, a restaurant, and there was an African American woman who had her hands full and was trying to open the door with her foot, and nobody got up to open the door for her. So. Rusty did. And needless to say, the horrible comments and words that flew out of the locals' mouth um, down south when she opened the door for the African-American woman. And again, of course, Rusty left and and waved a a specific finger in the air, but realized that wasn't right. You can't have that. And matter of fact, she spent a lot of time with her aunt, who, uh, who was a painter, who's my great aunt. And my aunt was always in the shadows of her husband, who was also a painter, and he was getting all the notoriety, excuse me, and she was supporting his career, but she was just as good. And my aunt, Lee Krasner Pollock, and supported her husband, Jackson Pollock. So Rusty grew up watching all of this inequity, and this is what formulated her fighting spirit. I know, I know I'm dropping a bunch of bombs on you, Jeremy. Sorry. I'm, I'm not used to having to reconcile <laughs> stories of greatness that have such diverse lineages of greatness along the way. I mean, 
you you are you are you are the genetic product of of Jackson Pollock and Samurai. <laughs> I mean, that's who who gets to say that? That's that's incredible. I love it. Thank you, thank you. And you know, I I feel that every bit of my lineage, every person that I had the the pleasure to know, to know I'm related, to interact with, to be influenced with, they're all a piece of me. And I every day strive to do better. I every day strive to positively affect the people's lives that I can possibly touch, whether it be direct or indirect through my work or uh, through whether I'm teaching uh, emotional intelligence or whether I'm teaching interviews and interrogation just to positively affect whatever lives that I can, because that's what Rusty wanted to do. She wasn't looking for awards. She wasn't looking for anything besides what, what, what was equal. She didn't want more. She would not settle for less. Mm. Uh, when she was told that, and, and by the way, I was part of some of these lawsuits uh, to file against the, along with the American Civil Liberties Union, against the United States Olympic Committee and the International Olympic Committee, and uh, whomever discriminated against women in sports and women in judo, Rusty made sure I was included in this history, so I understood it. And one of the things I asked Rusty when I was putting together the book uh, years ago, when she and I sat down to talk about it, I asked her, what do you want me to leave out? What do you want me to, to scrub? And she said, nothing, because if you don't put the history in it, there's a possibility history can repeat itself and women, once again, will be set back to the dark ages. Mm. I'm wondering, because if, if, if I've got my dates right, your, your mother passed away in 2009. Yes. So late enough that she would have known because it was Ronda Rousey was 2008 her Olympic medal right? yes okay yes uh and, Ron, I but, believe Ronda got her bronze in 2008 that, so that's, that's what my memory is saying so unfortunately not long enough to see what she did with that which has been an utterly amazing career over the last 13 years absolutely T touching touching so much and you know, for oh. a time, uh, not that we talk MMA on this show, but it's we have to acknowledge that during her tenure in the UFC, she was the biggest draw. Which, you know, how 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 often does a woman get to claim? You know, they are not the biggest in their division, but the biggest. That's and, true. Well, go. Uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, just a fun fact yeah. is uh, Rhonda's mom is Anne Marie. Uh, was on the judo team when Rusty was coaching. We were like, uh, we had several different teams, and Rhonda's mom was the first uh, woman to win, first U.S. woman to win a world championships. Mm. So I mean, she was a tenacious fighter. She's a brilliant. Uh, she also holds a PhD. She's a brilliant woman, uh, a very warm, kind, wonderful woman uh, that I, I consider my friend. And uh, we were on the U.S. team together. Uh, Rusty cool. was one of the coaches, of course. You know, not her judo instructor, but one of the coaches. And not too long ago, a couple of years ago, I got together with Anne Marie and, and Rhonda. And Rhonda's just, you wouldn't believe it if you saw, you know, her persona from television, but she is just one of the nicest people. I, I just feel like when I'm talking to you, I can just close my eyes and give her a hug because she's, she's that <laughs> yeah. sweet. And Everyone that I've spoken with who has met her has said that. Yeah, she, she's just terrific, absolutely terrific. And I read an article, actually, I saw an article that said, um, I think it was an article about Rhonda, that it said if there, was, if, if there would be no Rhonda without Rusty. And, and, that's, and that's kind of what I wanted to set up. And, and this is absolutely not to take anything away from, from, from Rhonda Rousey or Kayla Harrison or any of, of, of the male competitors, nothing. I'm not trying to take anything away. What I, I wanted to set up was a question towards her later years, because she she clearly, Rusty was out to do some amazing things. And, you know, I don't know how long the list was, but it seems like she got a lot done. 
as she got older and I'm assuming spent at least some time reflecting, what did she share with you about how she saw the transitions that she helped and in many cases spearheaded? She, well, uh, one, one of the things, uh, and Rusty and I would have a lot of really deep conversations uh, before she passed away uh, and, and really no airs, just, you know, no filters, just straight talk because time was limited and, you know, we both knew it. In uh, the Women's Sports Foundation and Richard Ader, actually Richard Ader opened a uh, the Rusty Kanakogi Fund for Girls and Women in Judo, and the Women's Sports Foundation manages it. So in 2000, early 2009, Rusty asked me to be on the committee to make the decisions on who gets the award. Each year, it's um, anywhere from, uh, I think it's up to $5,000 in sponsorship. Uh, myself, Richard Ader, and Billie Jean King at, at least are on the board as well as uh, some other people. I asked Rusty in 2009, who are you selecting for the first recipient, to be the first recipient of this award? And she said, Kayla Harrison. Mm -hmm. So I said, well, who's Kayla Harrison? Mm -hmm. And she looked at me and she said, you'll see. <laughs> she knew. She knew. She knew. Uh, and, and again, uh, Kayla, uh, love her dearly want to you know as much as as she unleashes in the cage and on the mat uh she is truly a hero and a champion for so many efforts on and off the mat she's just an amazing amazing person uh so when she told me you'll see and when i saw kayla win her first gold medal i couldn't stop crying mm. because that gold medal, granted, Kayla trained her guts out for, but a little, little piece, one, one gram of that medal, that was Rusty's. Yeah. Because it allowed, you know, Rusty had a dream that an American woman would win a gold medal in the Olympics. Yeah. And Kayla just satisfied it right there. And, and Rusty knew. For, for listeners who, who may not know, you maybe you recognize the name, Kayla Harrison won Olympic gold in judo in 2012 and 2016 and was the first American woman to do so. So it, in, in the judo space, it was, it was a huge deal. If I remember correctly, we talked a little bit about this on the episode I did interviewing Jimmy Pedro, which I, I, don't, I don't remember that episode number. We'll, we'll drop it in the show notes. And, and Jimmy's a, fan, a fantastic coach. He turns out champions after champions. Jimmy Pedro uh, was recently inducted into the International Judo, uh, judo Federation's Hall of Fame. The same year he was inducted into the Hall of Fame for the IJF, Rusty was the first American woman inducted into the IJF, IJF Hall of Fame uh, in Azerbaijan. And Jimmy was kind enough to accept the award on behalf of our family because mm -hmm. we couldn't travel at that time oh. to Azerbaijan to accept. So cool. That's... One more question, then I want to talk about the book because we, sure. we've hinted at it. And I want to make sure the listeners know, you know, what, that I, I well, we'll get there. Obviously, here now in hindsight, you see the the grandeur that you came from. That this woman, your mother, was the legacy that she's left behind. How old were you when you first realized it? Um, I would think I was about 14 when I realized, wow, mom is no joke because in 1980, she single-handedly along with members of our dojo held the first women's world judo championships in Madison Square Garden. And she was in charge. She was, in my eyes, as a teen, young teen, she was the person who was large and in charge. And I noticed it when I said, well, Rusty's my mom. And then if I wanted somebody to get out of my seat or something like that, well, Rusty, you know, Rusty's my mom. I'll go get her. And people would, <laughs> like, jumped out of the seat. I said, wow, mom is something. Uh, Rusty was told for women's judo, in order to become a, a possibility in the Olympics, you need a world championships. 
And uh, the U.S. at the time said to Rusty and challenged her, almost egged her on. Well, you know what? If you want women's judo, you can't. You don't have any standing because you don't have a world championships. And of course, Rusty retorted, "Well, I'll have a world championships." And they said, "Yeah, where?" And it was almost like a schoolyard banter. She goes, "Well, I'll have it at Madison Square Garden." And they looked at her, oh, really? She said, yes, really. So she came home and uh, went to our dojo and she said, all right, guys, we got to round up troops. We're having a world championships at Madison Square Garden. So somebody reminded her she only had about $140 in the bank. Uh, how are we going to do this? <laughs> so she literally pulled this off. And uh, I've never seen such a spectacular event, a memorial, a memorable event that, or memorable, sorry, uh, event held at Madison Square Garden as the first women's world championships and gave these women the opportunity to, to weigh in on the same scales as Joe Frazier and Muhammad Ali. And to this date, 40 years later, people are still talking about all over social media, their amazing experiences and posting photos. Uh, recently, one of, uh, one of the women posted a photo of the British team uh, visiting Coney Island and just reminiscing of this. And this was the start of how women judo can be included into the Olympics because the world championships started right then and there. Mm. Wow. Amazing. Amazing. And I'm going to guess that, you know, while most people would take five or 10 years to plan this out, your mother probably did it in what, like 12, 14 months or something. Less than that. <laughs> uh, she was, I think it was 1979 and February or, or January. Uh, no, I'm sorry. It was November or, or December of 78 she started coming up with this idea because uh, there were some Pan American championships held and the U S said, no, there's no such thing. But yet she would get letters from Venezuela saying, yes, we held the Pan American championships. And remember this is the seventies. So we don't have the internet and the cell phones and, and the photos. We have snail mail. Uh, so the U S didn't even, and said, well, we don't believe that they held these championships. And, uh, and that, I mean, it was just so ludicrous looking back in hindsight uh, but yeah, probably about 12 months. You're right. Gosh, 12 to 14 months then. That, that's, that's incredible. That's incredible. So, so let's talk about so, this book. You mentioned the title, yes. but you know, I, I think the why you wrote it is, is probably pretty apparent to anyone listening, but let's talk about the how I, I, I as a writer myself, I find the process that others use to be pretty fascinating. The why is part of a promise. I had three promises before my mom passed away. Uh, one was to finish my PhD, which I did, uh, and it's a PhD in psychology. Two was to always take care of and look out for my dad, which, knock on wood, he's very healthy, very happy, and very well fed because I always bring him some good food. Uh, and the third was to get her story out. She said, this story needs to be told. People need to know the truth. People need to know what happened. So back in about 2004, 2005, she started writing her manuscript. She started just free writing pen to paper, a narrative of her life. She would send me chapters. We'd clean it up. We'd put it in order. Uh, we would take some things out. So she and I kind of mulled through it, uh, 2004, 2005. And then she thought, okay, I can get this published. Maybe she worked with certain writers. And every writer she tried to work with, it was too fluffy. It was too once upon a time. And they wouldn't capture Rusty's voice because the writer would sit down with her and she would say something like, oh, you know, this, this Meshuggah. And they're like, what's a Meshuggah? Oh, get out next. <laughs> You know, or, or we call somebody, uh, I don't know if I can say certain words, certain Yiddish terms on the radio, but yeah, yeah. I, I don't, I don't think the censors at, at Apple Podcasts pick up on Yiddish, so, so have at it. I'll, I'll know yeah. what you're saying. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, the Michigano, or, or this guy was a real putz, or, you know, so when the writer would say, how do you spell putz? Oh, next, get out. And then on top of it, it was tough because not only did you have the Yiddish terminology, you had the Rustyisms and the Brooklyn terminology, and then you pepper that with the Japanese words and the, the Japanese terms of judo, and then Rusty's Brooklyn Japanese on top of it. Mm. You know, the only one who understood her was me yeah. because I speak all of that. I grew up in all of that. Uh, 
And so she told me, you got to get this story out. People need to know it because it's not just a judo story. It's a story of love for sport, love for humanity, love for my dad. Uh, it's a love story how he followed her back to the United States. And also it inspires people to get up and fight. And whether their fight is to go outside and get some fresh air, to get out of bed, to go to the gym and work out, whatever their fight is, it will inspire you because she was just an ordinary person uh, growing up, making the same mistakes, tripping over her own feet, but yet she was able to get up and fight. And uh, this story had to be told. The other thing it does is one of Rustyisms is in life, either you are the hammer or you're the nail. And she told me, you'd be the hammer. But being the hammer, people have this misconception that, you know, the hammer goes around bullying. No, the hammer is there as a supporter. The hammer is there to create because once you hit the nail, you're creating something. So the hammer is not the bully, but it's actually the leader. And you have to be a leader, whether it be in your own life or in the lives of others, because that's the only way humanity can keep moving forward in a positive way. So this story will tell you know the little girl some history. Uh, it'll give you a little bit of a cultural tour as she went through Japan and all of the antics over there. Uh, and it also will maybe inspire you to go do something and go change li lives of other people through whatever your talents are. Mm. Amazing. Where, where can people find the book? You can get this book uh, right now, the 40th anniversary of the First Women's World Championships, a special edition. It's very limited. You can get that at www.rustykanokogi.com. Uh, you can get the Kindle version on Amazon. And soon we're going to have a global release uh, to be determined sometime in May or June. But on rustykanokogi.com, you can definitely order this book. And we also have some challenge points. Cool. Nice. Wow. Th this has been phenomenal. I don't, I don't think I've laughed this much in an interview <laughs> in a long time. <laughs> Thank and you. I love the laugh. If, we, if you don't laugh, I mean, what's the point? Exactly. Exactly. L life is too ridiculous. And of course, the things that we do as martial artists are even more ridiculous than what the average person endures. You know, take it back to one of the things I said at the beginning, you know, we punch our best friends in the face or we throw them around and we wear pajamas. And it's, it's exactly. just you know, silly, but in the best way. You know, one of the biggest belly laughs I have to tell you, Rusty and I had was uh, we were doing Uchikomi, the form practice, and she was supposed to be anchored by two other people. I didn't realize that she was taking a quick break. So I came in on a technique and I threw her through the wall of the dojo. And we're both sitting there, sheetrock on our head, and laughing, not we couldn't even catch our breath laughing. Nobody else knew what to do, whether to help us, to look away, to laugh. My father walks over, not seeing if his daughter and wife were okay, but looks at us and said, oh, now I must fix wall, and walks away. <laughs> that sounds like the perfect anecdote for your entire family. Yes, that captures it. Oh, beautiful. I love it. Well, I always ask the guests, you know, what, what words do you want to use to send us out to the outro that I'll record later? You know, parting words of wisdom, final thoughts, motivation. How do you want to end? Uh, that's a good question. I'd like to end. Uh, well, first of all, I don't want to end because I, I mm. thoroughly enjoy talking to you. Um, but I think really with the rustyism, that in life, either you're the hammer or the nail, be the hammer and lead well. I think that that sums it up. I told you in the intro, I told you this was a woe sort of an episode. I laughed. I laughed hard. You didn't hear me. I was biting my hand from the laughter. The power of this episode really struck me. I hope you enjoyed it. I hope that you take Dr. Jean's words from her mother to heart. Be the hammer. And I hope that you'll also realize, however you look at this situation, this story, this dynamic of this, this amazing family, 
you'll see the value that everyone played, the pieces that needed to be there for each of them. It's easy for us to, to, to think of Rusty and, you know, hone in simply on what she was able to accomplish. But I can't imagine that, that all that would have happened without the other pieces of the puzzle, including Dr. Jean. So thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate the stories, the, the laughter, and the wonderful conversation that we had ahead of and after the show. Uh, sorry, listeners, you don't get to listen to those. That was just for us. Great times. If you want to see more from photos and links, all that for this and honestly, every other episode we've ever done, go to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. You can sign up for the newsletter. You can give us guest suggestions. You can check out a ton of stuff. And if you're up for supporting us and the work that we do, don't forget, you could share an episode, leave a review on Apple Podcasts or Google or Facebook or any number of places. You could also buy a book or a shirt, or you could also check out one of our training programs. We've got an amazing strength and conditioning program for martial artists, and you can do it at home. And it takes no equipment, and you can get it at whistlekick.com. So check that out. You can use the code PODCAST15 to save 15% off that program or anything else that we've got. Our social media accounts are at Whistlekick. My email is jeremy at whistlekick.com. That's it. Until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.